between Coltrane, Johnny Mitchell and, you know, the Christians. But I think that's in a sense what Wilson wants. As well as working for Granada TV as a newsreader, Anthony Wilson is a founder member and director of Factory Records, a key figure on the Manchester music scene. For a decade now, his non-compromising music business tactics have rubbed the London majors up the wrong way by ensuring that Factory remains independent and in Manchester. Uh, it's quite exciting. I mean, these days it's all like drug dealers and musicians living in another council. But thankfully, they don't put families in anymore. And this is the yeah. Caribbean Club it used to be well, the factory. It's always been the Russell Club, really. It's always been the Russell Club, and this was the factory before there was. Uh, before there was like a Factory Records, we opened, we, we ran a club here called The Factory in, uh, what, 1978. It was uh, the punk scene. And people, uh, as we do now, for the sake of this interview, used to sit on the steps out here in the sunshine. It's quite nice for the sunshine. Actually. What went on here when you owned, when you ran well, the club? Well, it was 78, 79, so it was like um, real heart of, uh, of post-punk, of coming out of punk. For Manchester, we had, uh, we had we had, A, we had punk really happening here in a way that because of its smaller environment and because of this, it had an intensity that it never had in London. You had that in Manchester, it produced Joy Division, the greatest group of their era, Buzzcott's greatest punk group, Joy Division, the, the most important post-punk group, in fact, the most important group since the Sex Pistols to today. But you had Martin Hannett, the great producer of his era, you had Peter Saville, the great designer of his era, you had all these, you know, all these things that were there, and we had a great journalist. We had Morley, a great journalist, you had Cummins, a great photographer, so we had top-class stuff in the city. The images come out of the design, they're vaguer, but words like grey, industrial, depressing, all, how does that fit? It's, it's like another of the myths, you know, doom laden. That's fine, I, I, I love all the myths, you know. Uh, it doesn't worry me at all, I mean, there's nothing gloomy. But here we gloomy. are in Hume. I don't find it gloomy, too gloomy. It's a bit of a drag today. It's a grey day today, but, you know, I find you quite exciting now. Manchester's very exciting, and, and, you know, it's like saying that Hamlet's gloomy or something. It's, even in those days, a Joy Division concert was not a gloomy experience. It was an outrageous experience. Dance, 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 dance to the radio. Dance, 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 dance to the radio. London critics want to talk about, you know, raincoats and doom. That's their choice. I never saw any doom. When you heard that he committed suicide? I was having my Sunday lunch, actually. What, was it, what were your first thoughts once you got over the shot? I thought, the f they're not going to get to America. It was on the evening of an American tour? Yeah, I was waiting to go to the airport, as I recall. <laughs> what were the first band discussions of the remaining members afterwards? What did they centre around? Well, the next just, step. It just centred around carrying on, really. I mean, we knew we enjoyed doing what we did, and we thought we were quite good at it. And we were sort of getting the acclaim as a band that people said, yeah, you're pretty good musicians. We like buying your music, listening to your music. So we just wanted to carry on. It was quite simple. Is there a myth about it, the uh, live past day, young leave a good-looking corpse and all that, which sort of... Um, yeah. There's not many groups do it. There's not many groups do it, no. We thought it was a good gimmick, actually. I'm very surprised he went along with it. Uh, <laughs> no, it's just something that happens. I mean, the, <coughs> the Doors and Hendrix and all these classic examples. In a way, it puts an end to something. 
so that people in the future can look back at it and say it started here and finished here. It's sort of like very neat and tidy. I, th I think the suicide thing, you know, it was nothing to do with the group really, was it? No. I mean, that was um, but the other world of his personal life, his yeah. personal life. But, you know, that's why that happened. Ian had taken an overdose some time before, and it's one of those things that you always, we'd all assumed it was a, a cry for help, plea for anesthesia or whatever. One, it was one of those ones that you presumed he was merely, you know, asking for help, and therefore it hadn't actually occurred to us that this would happen, it hadn't occurred. I think there is a mythic quality. I mean, Ian isn't a god, or wasn't a god, but I had rock and roll gods. I had Jimi Hendrix and uh, stuff like that, and the early Bob Dylan. And they were worth having. It's, it's a fabulous, popular, cultural experience to have those people as your little gods. And I think there's a whole world out there for whom Ian Curtis' mythic role can provide a level of, of feeling and of, of whatever that people deserve to have. I mean, all Town and Manchester, they build up something of an empire. With this recent acquisition, a five-story property which will open as a private members club called Dry later this year, and this place, the Hacienda, possibly the most futuristic looking club in Europe. New Order and Factory have come a long way since their staunchly independent days when they supposedly turned down a one million dollar American bid for Joy Division. Um, is that true? Well, I think it's funny from Martin, rather than strident independence. Uh, did you hear this one million dollars? I heard it after the event, yeah, I would have took a million dollars here. Yeah. I think they're going to be approached. Uh, the band with the offer. <laughs> and he got as far as Martin Hammond. Six miles out of central Manchester, this is Strawberry Studios, where Martin Hannett produced the bulk of Joy Division's music in the late 70s. And now Bitter Hannett refused to appear in this feature, but instead he issued this statement. Unfortunately, my business hat was not firmly fixed to my producing head. To cut a long story short, I left Factory with a derisory percentage of the earnings from the sale of these records in comparison with the producer's fees I would have received from even the most avaricious major label. What do you think of that? The you guys... Got lawyers. He took us to, he took us to court. Uh, it was his lawyers that agreed those amounts. We wanted to give him a better deal uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with points that he would have still been collecting on. He refused to... Uh, Accept this, the deal we offered him, which was a very, very good deal. I mean, I think what has happened now is that the people that run that particular record label uh, have in their kind of vocabulary a very kind of shrewd understanding of the way the world shifts. And there's no doubt that the idea of flogging the dead body, which is ultimately what it's about, however cruel that may sound, lead to respond. In no less a cynical way, I would have thought, than the way CBS flogged Bloss. What do you think of that? I've always thought the problem with his foolish anyway. Seriously, does it work to your disadvantage that the myth of Ian Curtis continues? Well, that's part of the reason why I don't like the video, which you haven't asked me about yet. Because I think the video very much concentrates on what Ian. What video? The atmosphere video concentrates on Ian very much. I don't like it. Be perceived now as you're going to release the compilation LP uh, substance. And I think, I think people follow. are going to perceive it as uh, some sort of rip-off, really. Why now, though? Why this particular point in time, which is it's not an anniversary, it's an arbitrary seven and a half, eight years after the event? Right. It's helped us with our uh, tax problems, I think it is. New Orders and Joy Division never put singles on albums. So when we, went, when, everyone, when we began to do CDs three or four years ago, we said, do you want to put your singles on the extra end bits? And they said, no, leave the albums as they are. So therefore, we always knew we had to do a CD of the singles. We happened to get round to New Orders last year, merely because it was harder to find the tapes for Joy Division. We got round to that this year. It is merely the accident of bringing out the digital versions of those singles which don't exist. But then it provides you with an opportunity to say, look at this, this was, this was the greatest rock mm -hmm. artist of his generation. And uh, isn't it interesting that it's so these days? I think if anybody's got the same kind of spirit and drive and response to the world as Joy Division now as a young person, they wouldn't go into pop. Because pop people, pop, the people that own pop, and we all know who they are, will not allow it to happen.